Good evening, adventurer. Come along with me, because I'm about to drag you kicking and screaming through the swirling and mystical mists of Celtic mythology. Imagine a world where every whisper in the woods is a story, and where every hero's deed is wrapped in magic as thick as the fogs on the Scottish Highlands. But I'm not just here to retell these old tales to you, oh no, my friends. We're going on a deep dive into the heart and origins of the stories that have been carried through the entire history of our culture. Exploring the brave heroes, the enigmatic gods, and mystical creatures that roam the ancient Celtic world. We'll be sifting through some old manuscripts, so this is going to be a long one. The very documents that carried the myths we know academically through time. Sources like the Mabinogin from Wales and the Book of Invasions from Ireland. Each one of these collectively is a treasure trove of lore and history. Each with their own unique and distinct quirks which we will also discuss. But we will flip through their myths and histories to help us get a better view of what the Celts who handed those stories down may have looked like. So if you're ready to dive into the stories of our ancestors, my friend, grab a drink, grab a seat. I've got a story for you. Welcome back to the Tavern Adventurers. For those of you who do not know me, I am Castle. This is the Black Dragon Tavern. I come from a long line of ancient storytellers. I am well educated in myth and literature. And here I talk about myth and lore and tales of yore. Most specifically, I like to show the stories that have been handed down through my family as we have a very unique and rich oral tradition. But today we're delving into the documents that academically have carried the whole of Celtic myth through time and what are recognised as the primary sources for Celtic myth today. So in Ireland, the myth is broken up into what is essentially cycles. And these cycles begin with the mythological cycle. And the first set of documents we have about the mythological cycle are called the Labor Garbalal Eran, which means the Book of Invasions. And this is a medieval collection of poems that recounts the mythological origins of Ireland, specifically detailing six waves of invasions by various peoples. And these stories blend mythological and historical elements together. Many of the stories attempt to link the Irish people not only to biblical figures like the daughter of Noah, but also figures of antiquity like the sons of Mill, the Malaysians. So we will begin by flipping the pages back to an era that is truly shrouded in mist and mystery and that is the era in Ireland of the ancestors known as the Tuatha Dé also referred to as the Tribe of Danu, which is a tale as magical and mysterious as the beings themselves, descending from the clouds with their dark ships and touching upon the Emerald Isle, bringing with them skills, power and knowledge that seem to bend the very laws of nature. Now, before we go too deep into that, it's important to note that the Tuatha Dé Danann are often depicted as being gods and mystical beings, but in the earliest texts and stories we have, they're not referred to as gods or immortals or mystical beings at all. They're referred to as humans. And many of our ancestors likely did not see them as god, but instead early ancestors of their own. They were mortals who tried to invade Ireland and were pushed back by the Fomorians, the original and mystical ancestors and inhabitants of the Emerald Isle. And after being repelled, they returned after having learned a great and mystical magic somewhere in the north, and they began to dominate the landscapes of Ireland, then known as the Land of Eriu. And they will eventually become the sovereign over all of Ireland for many hundreds of years, stealing the land away from their previous inhabitants, the Fomorians. 
And their story is one of ascension, becoming something more and greater through the mastery of some arcane and natural art. Not incredibly different from the legendary sons of Mil, known as the Malaysians, or the Fearbolg, the Bagmen, who also invaded Ireland twice. And all of these groups were a powerful force in shaping the destiny and landscape of Ireland. Among these powerful beings, there are some key figures whose legendary exploits and actions stand out from all of the rest. But as we speak on these figures, it is important to remember that their tales, their stories are woven into the very land of Ireland. Each hill, stone and river carrying whispers of their great deeds. And while they are revered today as deities of old, the ancient sagas and the oral tradition of my clan remind us of their humble beginnings. Powerful ancestors whose extraordinary deeds would elevate them to the status of gods in the eyes of some who would come after them. So as we recount the tales of the Tuatha Dé Danann, let us do so with an understanding of their very complex nature. A blend of human origin and divine ascension of sorts. And this makes them some of the most intriguing and enduring figures in all of Celtic mythology. Take for instance the Dagda, who is known also as the Good God. Not just for his benevolence, but also for his mastery over life, death, and of course agriculture. He even had a mystical cauldron known as the Koraansik, and it was said to be a source of endless sustenance, not dissimilar to a horn of plenty. And over time it became known as a symbol of abundance and prosperity, for it would never let any go hungry or be left wanting. At least not while the Dagda was around, he was kind of the party animal, he never really let things be dull. Who also wielded a club that could not only take life in a single hit, but also restore life with a single touch. I like to think that he would bat people around, you hit them with one end, they die, and then you smack them with the other end and they come back to life. Just because it's a silly sort of image to put into your mind about what this giant, and he was a literal giant in the stories, probably over 20 feet tall. And then there is Lu, who is one of my absolute favourite characters in all of Celtic mythology. Master of Arts and known as Lu La Father, which was a reference to his long arms and his ability to throw a spear, who today still has a festival called Lunessa, which is very similar to the skill-based games that we would see in Scotland that are called the Highland Games. His stories are those of a clever and versatile warrior, a craftsman without equal whose talents were as varied as the people he protected. His prowess was renowned throughout all of Ireland, even among those in the Fomorians and the Tuatha Dé Danann. And his role in their greatest battles was absolutely pivotal. Next we have the Ulster Cycle, which is the cycle that starts to blend more of the historical aspects with the mythological aspects. And central to the Ulster Cycle is the epic of the Tame Bokuli or the Cattle Raid of Cooley. Yes, the central epic of the Altar Cycle is about the attempted theft of a prized steer. Now, to be fair, it was a giant steer that could allegedly kill mythical beasts, but it was still a steer. This is also one of the primary tales that feature the hero of Ulster and probably one of the most prominent figures in all of Celtic Irish mythology, and that is Cocolin, Satanta, the Hound of Colin. And it is a rich tale interweaving heroism and daring do, as well as honour and tragedy. It also shows us Cocollin's unbelievable strength and prowess, as well as gives us the prophecy of his demise. And for those of you who don't know, Cocollin is one of the central hero figures of the Ulster Cycle, and one of the most beloved figures in Irish mythology, best known for his Ristrad, which was his battle frenzy, where he would grow twice or three times the size, his head spinning to the side and blood spurting from his eyes, as he went into battle stronger than any man and able to break men fully in half, as well as plenty of other things I would presume. He is an absolutely spectacular and fascinating character, who tragically dies early because of two different prophecies. And that transitions us into the Fenian cycle, which follows a figure called Fin Makovel, or Fin Makumel, depends on who or where you're asking. Central to his story is how he gains all of the knowledge in the world, and this ends up leading him to grow quite old. As time goes on, he has the knowledge on how to live a long 
and healthy life. And he does this by accidentally consuming a piece of the Salmon of Knowledge. Now the Salmon of Knowledge and the Hazelnuts of Knowledge are key folklore ingredients for many Irish folklore and mythologies. And what it is, is all of the knowledge in the world is contained in the hazelnuts that fall from this tree. They fall into a well and the salmon in that well eat them. So the salmon and the hazelnuts contain all of the knowledge in the world. And while Finn's master was asking him to cook up the salmon, he burned his thumb and mm, sucked on it like that. And with that one small action, he gained all of the knowledge of the salmon of knowledge, which can only be eaten once and inadvertently stole that privilege away from the druid Finnegus, who was his master and mentor at the time. Now, the reason why Finn is important is because he is allegedly related to both Lou and Cocolin, and those stories change depending on where they are being told. And the next story in Finn's chronicle is of his betrothal to a young woman named Grania, and Unfortunately, she is betrothed to him when he is quite aged and does not find herself in love with him. But she does end up falling in love with a young lad named Tirmud, and they run off together and this is a tale of both betrayal as well as the love one must have for their family and those who they are responsible for. A lot of these tales really look at the complexities of human relationships. But then we are headed into the historical cycle and this is where we have direct lineages that go back to most of these figures. The historical cycle is often referred to as the cycle of kings. And it is the narrative of the multiple high kings of Ireland over the last 1500 to 2000 years or so. Most famous of these is probably the tale of King Cormac Macaire a wise and just king known for his fair judgments and the prosperities of his reign. And his life, of course, was filled with wisdom and magic and adventure, and unfortunately, like many Irish heroes, a tragic end. Where, just like Cocolin, he died by breaking a geis or geese, which is a pledge that cannot be broken at punishment of death or a severe price must be paid. Now, that is basically where Irish myth comes from, but that is not the only place from which we pull Celtic myth. There are also Celtic myths that come to us from Wales, and that document is called the Mabinogion. And the first of these stories is of a character called Pwyll, Prince of David. And the story begins by introducing Pwyll and his adventures into the other world, which in Celtic mythology would be known as Magturit, Tiernanog, or Magmail. And the most significant part of his story is the alliance that he builds with Aran, King of Anu, which was the otherworld afterlife of Welsh mythology. And in that story, he agrees to switch places with Iran for one year in order to defeat his greatest enemy, Havgan. And one of the common themes amongst all of these stories is the ease at which one can transfer between the realm of the Fae or the realm of the afterlife, or just what is often referred to as the other world, and the realm of mortals or the physical realm. This is a common thematic throughout much of Celtic myth. And the next story in the Mabinogion is of Branwyn. And Branwyn is one of the famed three matriarchs of Britain. And the tale navigates her tragic story first being pledged to the King of Ireland, which was intended to forge an alliance, but that ends, of course, as these things often do, in treachery and war, which inevitably leads to a series of tragic events, which is another common thematic in these stories. And there are several more stories within the Mabinogion that not only link the Welsh to King Arthur, but also to other great Irish figures and deities. One of the most important takeaways from these many documents and stories is the way that our ancestors likely looked at these tales or even viewed the circumstances and events as they were happening. In Celtic mythology, nature is a living tapestry. Things just sort of happen for no reason. Every tree, river, and stone all carry their own story. It calls to mind a scene from an old cartoon called Quest for Camelot. Do you remember this? I know the sound of each rock and stone And I embrace what others feel You are not to roam in this forgotten place Just the likes of me are welcome here And in each of those stories, 
tales and songs, there is always a lesson, but it is not overt, it is more or less one we learn by not making the dumb decisions that our ancestors did. So as we delve into these stories, whether I am telling a tale of ancient myth, of common folklore, of urban legends, or even of modern fiction, it is important to remember the quill that tells the story, the pen that writes the page, if you will. Now I bring this up because it's important to remember that much of our cherished Celtic myths were penned in the hush monastic scriptoria by Christian monks hidden away from many, 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 many years transcribing cultural legend as well as collected documents, sometimes second, third, or even fourth party delivered to them whose worldview seeped into every saga and shades every tree and story and tale as they write them, imposing some of their own spiritual and cultural biases on the tales that existed long before they did. Now, don't get me wrong, these texts are invaluable treasures, windows into a long, long forgotten past. But as we peer through those windows, it is important to remember the tint that they carry often carrying the hue of medieval Christianity and the personal interpretations of those devoted scribes. Now, they have given us a version of the Celtic beliefs, one that was filtered through their lens of the time, their faith, and most importantly, their understanding of the world. And even more important to note that this is still the standard today. While there may be more faiths and there may be more biases, this is still what we must remember when looking at any old story that is transcribed. Not to lessen its validity, but to understand that there is a broader understanding to be had outside of those few words of our ancestors that made it on to ink and paper. So while we should embrace these stories for their beauty and their insight, let us also tread thoughtfully acknowledging the layers of history and belief that they journeyed through to reach us. Another way that we can contrast is to my clan's oral tradition, which offers a raw and unfiltered glimpse of the Celtic world and even the Norse and other Scandinavian cultures of the time when our clan began collecting stories some several hundred years ago. And these stories were preserved through many generations, passed on with the intention to not alter them but hand them on as they were handed to us. And this was probably done with the intention to present a different and possibly more authentic version of these myths. Now, that's not to say that they are more authentic or that they are more accurate or that they are even better, just that there were more variations that existed than those that have remained in commonality through time. And in my years teaching on these stories and traditions and the folklore and the culture, I've heard many people who have come forward and talked about the stories that have been handed down through their family, some going back several hundred years. And just for instance, one of my favorite tales regarding the Morrigan is that the Morrigan is not a single figure, but instead a collective, much like the Norns or the Fates. It is a title that is given to a council of wise and powerful women. And their job, more or less, was in mythological sense to oversee the souls of those who died. And in an actual sense was to advise the leaders of the time as to what they are do to avoid too much conflict on the Green Isle. Now that varies greatly from what is told in common myth, but that is an example of how a clan or a regional mythology, a clan or regional teaching might have differed from the commonality that managed to survive at the time. But as we've wandered through all of these myths and lores and traditions, I think one thing becomes crystal clear. These myths were so much more than just stories. They were vital and integral threads in the Celtic consciousness of our ancestors. And the more we look at them, the more we see a panoramic view of what our ancestors may have seen in nature and magic and humanity. And that they likely believed that all of those things were inextricably intertwined in almost a divine way. Each legend, each character, each aspect was a gigantic brushstroke, just painting the world in a more colorful manner. And they reveal a time and a society where perhaps every tree had a spirit, had a story, had a voice. And where the figures we now see as gods just walked one step behind the veil of reality. They were just 
one generation away from being real in the minds of everyone. So while these stories may be layered with centuries of retelling and interpretation, their essence remains a beacon of sorts, guiding us to have a slight understanding of a profoundly interconnected universe, as seen through the eyes of our ancient ancestors. So the next thing that I want you to remember is that as we recount and retell these old tales, we're not simply retelling old tales. We are breathing new life into a world where Fate and honor dance together, and wisdom walks alongside the wildness of nature. In the battles of Kokolin and the quests of Finn Machumal, and deep inside the vivid sagas of the Mabinogan, we're touching the very soul of Celtic mythology. And in a way, this is how we keep our ancestors and that culture alive. We're not just preserving history, we're preserving a culture. We're preserving the very essence and magic that our ancestors not only believed in, but lived their lives by. And in sharing this and keeping it alive as a cultural foundation, it can teach us new depths about our experience as humans and the way that we pass on our immortality in the form of stories. And as we carry these tales forward, sharing and pondering them, I always like to believe that the magic stirs anew for every new individual who has heard one of these tales a little bit of the old world revives. Mother Nature shakes in her bed, and that magic, that whimsy comes back alive. And maybe, just maybe, our ancient ancestors look down and smile upon us, whether from the sky or from the trees. So tell me this, my friends, which ancient story gives you the greatest feeling of whimsy? And would you like to see a version of Where Do the Mists Come From? On Nordic Myth, if so, let me know down below, and until next time, my friends, that we join together in the tavern, I bid thee stay bloodthirsty for adventure, wisdom, and tales. And remember, all hail the Black Dragons. I'll see you next time, my friends.